right, I think we are live now. We are broadcasting. I think we're all good. Sweet. Um, hi, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to the live broadcast today. My name is Danny, and I am the lead instructor for the graduating cohort that you're about to see them present their projects. Um, so basically, we're going to do a couple of sets today just to go over some format for anyone who's watching live. Um, we're going to have, we've got 14 students who are graduating who are presenting their projects and uh, we're going to split them into seven and seven so that we've got a little intermission in the center. So uh, after our first seven, we're going to take about a 30 minute break and then we're going to come back and we're going to do the second seven. So that live stream is going to go down for a little break in the middle there. Um, but yes, I am Danny. I'm the lead instructor for the projects that you're about to see presented. And uh, we are a coding boot camp. We were established in Chicago. And uh, one of the things that I love most about my job as the lead instructor of Actualized Coding Bootcamp is that I get to work with a lot of extremely uh, motivated individuals who are all taking a big leap to transition into a career in software engineering from whatever they were doing before. And we get students from pretty much every career that you can imagine from music to bartending to uh, data, big data, it, they come from everywhere and they are transitioning careers into web development. And I get to work with people who are very motivated and very dedicated and who have learned growth mindset and that they can pretty much do anything. And they have built these projects from the ground up. So the projects that you're about to watch um, are full stack projects, meaning there is a back end and there is a front end that these students built entirely on their own. Um, so they use the fundamental web development knowledge that we've learned over the last four months uh, through pre-work and through live class uh, to build these apps from the ground up. And one of the things that we teach here at Actualize is that developer mentality. Um, we like to say that we don't necessarily teach you a particular language or a particular framework, but rather we teach you how to teach yourself because that's the most important tool that you, can, uh, that you can have in your tool belt when learning to be a web developer. Um, so what I'm going to do is introduce um, our CEO, Jay, real quick, just to say a couple of quick words. Um, because he's here in our Zoom meeting right now. Um, so I'm gonna have Jay maybe do a little quick introduction and uh, say a little, little blip about himself. Sure, I won't talk too much about myself, but I am Jay Wengro, the founder and CEO of Actualize. Uh, thank you for everyone uh, watching and being here today. Um, I'm just gonna echo some of the things that Danny said uh, and that this is a very exciting day because this marks the graduation of this Actualize Online Live cohort. Um, and most people assume that there's no way on earth they can learn to code, but these individuals have said, I can do this. Um, and it's a very intense program and they've really dedicated themselves. And I'm really excited to see their capstone uh, presentations shortly. Um, I want to in particular thank Danny, our amazing lead instructor who expertly and skillfully leads the entire instruction of the cohort um, and she's a fabulous lead instructor and one of the primary architects of our online live format which we've been doing now uh, since 2017 before COVID. Um, and I want to also thank the TAs and the panelists who are here and uh, Lisa our career advisor for also uh, teaching the students about the job hacking mindset as well. Um, and I'm looking forward to the presentations. Cool. Thanks so much, Jay. And um, yeah, Jay's going to be acting as one of our panelists today, asking um, a couple of questions to the students about their projects after they present. And we do have another panelist here today in the room. Uh, Karen, I'll have you do a little introduction of yourself as well. Hey, everyone. I am Karen. I graduated from Actualize in 2016. I am now a software engineer at Coyote Logistics doing uh, mobile work, which is actually what I really wanted to do when I was uh, in the boot camp. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to see everyone's projects. Um, I've been to a few showcases now and every time it just gets better and better. So I'm really excited to see what you guys have. Awesome, thank you so much, Karen. Um, okay, and so without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna get started with our actual presentations, our first set of seven. And uh, to kick us off, we've actually got Sam. So Sam, why don't you go ahead and share your screen and give us your present presentation. Hi, 
Um, I'm excited to start this off. Uh, my name is Sam. Uh, my project's name is Sharsherith, which in Hebrew means chain or connection. Uh, this is a social media app for new immigrants to Israel. Um, I designed this app uh, because I, I made Aliyah to, to Israel back in 2015, which is the, the process of becoming a new citizen. And I understand how difficult it can be to, to move to a whole new country. You're learning a whole new language, a whole new culture, a whole new lifestyle. So I thought this app could help uh, ease that transition by bringing together new immigrants. So here is my app. We have a, a login page. Uh, there's also a sign up. Uh, you can put in your name, email, password. I have a, a user already, so we're going to sign in as Sam. So firstly, you're brought to the events page. This is uh, an index of, of all the events that the users have created on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have my events that, that I have created. So it's just a simple way to, to find your own events in, within the, the index. So let's take a look at the events. We have a Hebrew practice, a book club. We have a uh, painting. So each event has a location, a time, uh, a number of attendees, the, the host name. And at the top, there's also a search functionality. So if you wanted to find events in Tel Aviv, you just type Tel Aviv and we have all the events in Tel Aviv. If we wanted to find a, let's say football event, we have two events, football and soccer whichever, however, what you want to call it. And uh, on the left hand here, we have a, a create event. So let's go ahead and create an event. Let's say we want to make a hiking event. And then we'll add a description. And then a location. And then let's say tomorrow, Saturday at 1.40 PM. And then we'll add a nice image. And this will be in Israel, the Golan Heights. So here, this event is created and it's added to the, the index. So now every user can see this event. And over here, we can see this event was created uh, down here. So here we can see the image, uh, location and time, the name of the event. There's also an edit option because it's your event, a description. And there's a button down here, attendees and an attend button. And then we can see the host on the right side and then a location. And you can zoom in and zoom out. And there's also, if you go to a specific, let's say we go to Hebrew practice, we can also click on attendees and then we have a pop-up of all the users in the event. So now let's go to the people, the users. And so here we can see all the users in, uh, in, in Sharsheret. So we can see John, Tomer, we see their profile picture, we see their current location, and we see uh, plenty of users. And there's a search functionality where we can look by name. So we wanna look for, let's say Roy, we find Roy, or if we wanna find all, all, all of our users in Tel Aviv, we have five users in Tel Aviv. And now let's, let's click on a user so we can see their profile page. So here, we can see Oren Hartov. On the top, we see his current location. We see his profile picture, and then we see his images. We click here, we can see that Oren has two images. There's a description. And then on the right-hand side, we have an about section that has his country of origin, his Aliyah date, and his hobbies. And at the bottom, we actually have an option to send him a message or go to con current conversation. That depends whether or not you already sent a message to this user. So let's go ahead and look at our current conversation with Oren. So this is Sam talking to Oren. And I actually implemented a WebSocket so that messages are received instantly. So here we'll have an example. So Sam is messaging Oren. And in the right-hand side, we have Oren. So I'm going to go ahead and say hello. And we can see that both users now just received hello. And then Oren is going to send hi. So now both users can see the, the messages being updated instantly. So that is the, the core functionality of my application. Uh, there's also an option uh, to go to your profile. And here, uh, there's more functionality. We can add images. So let's go ahead and add an image to Sam. Let's say we want to add 
Uh, let's go ahead and add this picture. And now we click on images. And now we can see that this image has been added to Sam's images. And now there's also an option to delete an image. And there's also an option to edit your own profile. So you can change your name if you want, your bio, your current city, whatever you want. So yeah, that, that is my application. And uh, in terms of future implementation, I think I wanna add, cause this is a social media app. I wanna add a friending feature with the ability to add friends. I think that's sort of a, a, the core of any social media app. And then I would like to add probably a, a news feed uh, feature where users can upload posts and then their friends can see that. I think that's also the core of any social media app. So I'm, I'm really excited to work with this. And in terms of any struggles or difficulties, I think working with complex associations uh, and, and getting that to work in both the front end and back end was, was challenging, especially between conversations and users and messages. Uh, but it was rewarding because I, I learned quite a lot. Like I, I went from knowing quite a bit to so much more. Like this project really like opened my eyes and I'm really glad that I did it. I really look forward to, to continue working on this after class. So that is my application. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, if there's any questions. Let's hand it over to Jay. Yeah, Sam, this is a fantastic app. Uh, I love the fact that it's so fully featured. Um, so I had some questions about the implementation of some of the features, um, starting with the map. Um, I know it seemed like sort of like a side thing, but how, how does it detect the location? So I used, so I'm using a, a, a map box, um, sort of a, I downloaded this into my um, application mm -hmm. in the Vue.js and I'm using a, a geocoder. So I have a, a search query that, that searches in the, in the back end or the front end. And then you, you, the user um, puts in an address. So I'll show you. Like you did with Golan Heights. Exactly. So let's say I go to my event and I click on uh, edit. So here, this is an attribute address here in the back end. And then in the front end, that address is placed for the, the search query in the geocoder. So it'll find cool. that Golan Heights and then it'll add a marker. It's one of the, the features uh, within the, this map box uh, application. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I was curious to know more about the WebSocket feature, which is awesome. Um, was that a challenging thing to implement and how did you go about that? Yeah, so Danny taught us this, uh, this feature. Um, I would say it, it was difficult just because there's a lot of steps involved. Uh, it's, it's, made, it's both back end and front end. Uh, she, she taught us, you know, like the, you know, that there's certain, uh, coding that you have to do in the back end. I, I can show you actually in the back end, uh, because this wasn't easy. And Danny, uh, really worked with us on this and I, it was not easy to say. Um, so here in the create section, uh, we have an action cable in the back end that goes to the server and then it, it takes your message. Um, and then in the front end we have in our messages conversation show, we then have it implemented. Uh, do you do if I can find it? Well, it'll take a while to find, but yeah, it's essentially, yeah, it's, it's both back end and front end. It was, it was not easy. Yeah, no, really well done. Um, was there anything that like really surprised you when working on this project? Yeah, I mean, th there were certainly a few things. I, I thought this project would be a little easier. It turned out to be much harder uh, doing a lot of these things because you, you go down rabbit holes. You try to, you think, oh, I'll just add this modal with all these pictures and all of a sudden it, it creates this problem and then you go down another rabbit hole and it creates this problem. And it's just, you're just going down all these rabbit holes and it's just, it just never ends. And it's just, ugh. Yeah. but it, well, it's, it's fun, it's, it's fun. Welcome to the life of the developer. <laughs> um, really fantastic job, Sam. Thank you. Really cool app. Awesome. Thanks so much, Sam. Yeah, um, he's totally right about the rabbit hole thing. And I tell my students all the time, uh, make sure you're not falling into that rabbit hole. And then they fall right into that rabbit hole. <laughs> um, Sam did a really amazing job. He was able to get a lot of features work um, with actually very minimal assistance. So well done, Sam. 
Um, and we're gonna go ahead and pass it over to our next presenter, uh, Colin, go ahead and share your screen, take it away for us. I don't think we can hear you, Colin. Mm -mm. Can't hear you. Might want to check your uh, your mic settings. Bottom left of the Zoom window. Maybe we don't have the right mic selected. Try it out. Perhaps. <laughs> it's not working. So we'll give you a few minutes to uh, to get your mic situation sorted out and I'm gonna move it on over. Um, if Ian is ready, we'll kind of swap the order here. We'll let Ian go ahead and share his screen and take over. Go ahead and take over. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, hi there. Um, my name is Ian Fletcher. Um, I'm really excited to uh, show you guys my project here. Um, one of the things that kind of drew me into um, computer programming and just computers in general was video games. It's always been a big passion of mine. Um, I've been playing games since I was a kid and still play pretty often today. Um, one of the games that I played a lot as a kid was a game called RuneScape. Um, and it was actually a game that was entirely hosted on the web. It was a, a web game, um, a big online, uh, lots of players. There'd be hundreds of thousands of people playing at a time. Um, and so I decided I, I had gotten back into it recently. And uh, I realized that there was a lot more to this game. I kind of had a new lens um, to look at this game through. Uh, before I would play it, it was pretty open-ended. There's not a clear goal. You can kind of go around and do whatever you want. And uh, I came back at it with a little bit more of a strategy and realized I needed a little bit of assistance there. Um, I would find myself constantly with like 10 tabs open of there's a big Wikipedia page for this game, um, trying to organize my thoughts and decide what I wanted to do next. And so I decided to solve this problem. Um, I, I made an app called OSRS Track. And uh, just to give you a little context, I want to show you a clip, quick clip of the game. Um, so this is what it would look like in your browser. The graphics haven't quite held up, but it is a very massive game. It's super fun. Um, there's a lot of complexity to it. And I was trying to harness that a little bit uh, and try to, try to reel it in and, and make it a little more, um, little more doable. So without further ado, show off my app here. So for starters, this is my uh, splash screen. This is the home page. So I give you a little description of, of what's going on with the app, um, designed it just to help you organize your thoughts. We've got a login if you've already got an account or you can sign up if not. Um, so just to show you my, my art there, we've got a quick sign up screen, but I already have an account. I'm already actually logged in as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to the boards. So the main context of the app, um, you can create boards for your different accounts. A lot of players that play this game will have multiple accounts because you can be at different points in your, your journey. Um, some players get towards the end game and it loses a little bit of interest. So they'll start newer accounts and, and kind of start over so they can have more stuff to do. Um, so in case you have multiple accounts, you can have multiple boards here. You've got an option if you wanna make a new one, you can add a board there. Um, but I will go ahead and show you, this is my main board that I've been working on. So clicking into your board, then you get um, your three lists here. So some of the, the main points of the game, um, there's a bunch of different skills that you can level up. Like I said, there's not a real clear um, end goal, but kind of the, the whole progression system is based around leveling up different skills. You can do quests that will give you um, experience in different skills or give you certain items that will be beneficial to your progression. Um, and then you just kind of progress and you get better and better equipment, you get better weapons, better armor, um, 
better items that will make your, your life easier, make things quicker. Um, so again, I was just trying to kind of organize the thoughts here. Um, so some of the main features, I was able to pull all of the quests from the game. There's about 145 quests. Um, and I pulled all of the tradable items within the game. Um, there was some APIs online that I was able to scrape through and, and pull what I wanted there. Um, so showing that off, say you decide you want to do, there's a quest called Waterfall Quest. So it gives you lots of XP. So say you want to do that next, you can search for that here, pops up a little modal, and you can add that to your list. And then you can keep your, your stuff organized there with what you want to do next. And then again, instead of having 10 tabs open at all times, you can click this link here. That'll bring you to that Wikipedia page. You can kind of go through and see what you need to do, see what equipment you might need. Um, that gives you the, the extra details that you need there. Same thing kind of with the items. Um, there's a ton of items in this game. So keeping, uh, keeping a list of what you're going for next can be pretty important. Otherwise, there's just so much that you can, can lose track of. Um, so you're, you're working for that next sword that you want to get. You can search for that as well. Throw that on your list, and it's going to pop up top there with the little icons from the game as well. And then the same deal here. You can always open that Wikipedia page. If you want the stats for the items, if you want any extra info, that's all there. Um, and then along with the, the skills and just all of the, the other context of the game, um, there's a lot to keep track of. So I thought a note system would be pretty helpful. Um, certain items and things like that need certain skills to do. The quests have certain requirements um, with skill levels. So you can keep track of things like that. Um, there's also just like certain tasks in the game you might want to keep track of for your week. Um, any of these notes, you can add new ones. You can add a new note. If you decide you want to be a little more specific, you can go in and change that. Uh, or when you finish a task, you can delete that right off your list. And that is the, the main bulk of my app there. Um, ran into a few challenges. I think the, the biggest challenges for me was implementing the theme was definitely a lot more challenging than I thought. I had the, the functionality working um, fairly quickly and, and was, was happy with it and then did not realize how hard it was going to be to completely reformat that in with all of the HTML. Um, just when you get to mountains of code, it's, it's a little overwhelming, but that part was really fun. Um, getting to, to make your functioning app look really pretty is cool. Um, but then I think the, the other really interesting part for me was using the APIs and having to, to kind of scrape through those. Um, there was a few APIs online. I, I underestimated a little bit how, how hard this project would be. I thought it was going to be as simple as, you know, making the, the calls to those APIs and getting back the data I needed. But I realized pretty quickly that there was either limits on those calls or they w didn't have search queries that functioned exactly how I needed. Um, so I kind of had to, I, I ended up, instead of using the API for all of the calls, I went through and scraped what I needed and added that to my own database so that I could just have all of the, the data on hand. Um, yeah, and then there's a, there's a few more features I'd like to implement in the future. Um, the skills, like I said, are a very important part of this game. So there is an API as well for that to, to pull your skills for your accounts. Um, so that is a feature I'd like to work in soon. Just being able to display that in the, the correct way would, would be the biggest challenge, I think. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to keep working on it. Awesome. Thanks, Ian. Um, yeah, and we'll actually see uh, a few of my students are awesome gamers like myself, <laughs> and we've built a few gaming apps. Yeah, and Ian actually basically built his own database of items to do this, which was really, really cool. Um, so well done, Ian. And I'll go ahead and throw it over to Karen to ask a couple questions. Well, thanks, Danny. That actually goes into my first question that I had was um, the items, when you're adding items to the wish list, where did that come from? Did you, is that from the API or did you actually create the API? So I, I did use an API. Um, I, I ended up, pulling though there was actually a just a giant JSON file online that had um, the items that I needed but there was like there's like 35,000 items in this game I didn't want to have all of that in my database so I went through and scraped for ones there's a an attribute that was just marked for ones that were tradable um, so I went through and grabbed those 
but I do actually have, uh, I ended up putting it it's in my seeds file. So you'll see I have a, a big giant chunk of, uh, of item IDs and everything going in there right now. Um, and then something like the icons as well. Uh, that was stuff that it was online in an API already, but I had to go through and, and scrape through that. Um, so I ended up like, let's see, I wrote a script um, in the model. So I, I just ran this once to go grab all those icons and add it to my database. Um, and then I was able to have those icons as well. Gotcha. Okay. Wow. That's really cool. Um, do people still play RuneScape? They do, surprisingly. Um, <laughs> this is this is based on like the old school version as well. So it's like a snapshot of the game from like 2007. But if you get on, there's always at least like 100,000 people playing, which is pretty crazy to me. Wow. Okay. So then did that, do you think that helps? Um, well, did that help you in your project? Because, you know, when APIs get old and unmaintained, they tend to not work mm -hmm. anymore. <laughs> No, it certainly did. Um, the The community for the game is still super huge. That was part of my inspiration as well as I wanted it to be something that was relevant. Um, even though it's super niche, I thought some other people might get a kick out of it as well if I host it eventually online. Um, but yeah, there was an API that, that there's a, a guy just online. He's got his own API that he still updates like every week. <laughs> every week when they update the game, he's on there updating his API. Wow, that is so cool. So do you think you're going to actually publish this so that other players can use it? I would like to, yeah. The goal was to make something um, that I would use myself. And I think if if, I, if I'm if i using it, I, I'd like to share it with other folks and see if anyone else um, finds it useful. Yeah, for sure. Um, is there anything from this project that you, like what was something unexpected that you learned? Um. Honestly, just dealing with APIs in general, um, I think was the most unexpected thing. I, I, we learned quite a bit about that in class and we had some examples of, you know, using pretty well documented and well organized APIs that, that function the way we expected them to. Um, having something that someone else made just out of pure love for this game, um, I think it was a little bit less structured. And there, there was a few different APIs online floating around that, that I had looked at and I definitely like underestimated that aspect. I thought it would be as easy as, oh, I just need to make these calls and get back the data and I can do whatever I want with it. But I, I kind of found out pretty quickly that it wasn't that easy. <laughs> oh yeah, real life APIs can sometimes be the bane of your experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you use, a, what UI library did you use? Um, I used Vue and then um, for the, the theme, it was just one I found on Wrap Bootstrap. Um, I, I reformatted a lot of stuff. These were like originally pricing guides uh, that I <laughs> turned into lists that worked for me. <laughs> wow, how, that's awesome. How did that go? That was honestly, that was one of the hardest parts was uh, I, I shopped around looking at themes for a while. Um, my app is is seemingly pretty simple like it doesn't have too many crazy moving parts and it's only a few pages um but a lot of the themes were actually designed i think more for pretty large scale apps so i had to dial back a lot of the like default templates and stuff like that and kind of draw just the certain components that i wanted um and that part proved to be pretty challenging trying to had you know take a whole page and then cut out the extra fat and stuff like that Oh, right. Stripping down. I mean, when you have a simple app and you're trying to use the theme, stripping it down can actually be a lot harder than just using it the way it is. So good job right. with that. It looks, it looks really good. Like it, Thank it you so much. clean and crisp. Yeah. Hey, yeah, you're welcome. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ian. Yeah, um, this was definitely really fun to work with Ian to get some of these things to work the way that they do. And uh, yeah, I think this is super useful. I wish I had a tool like this for some of the games that I play. <laughs> Thanks um, so much. Yeah, so we're going to go ahead. I think Colin's maybe got his microphone situation sorted out. So we're going to go ahead and throw it over to Colin. Can we hear you, Colin? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yeah, woo. Okay. All right, go ahead and share your screen and we can hear you. Share. OK, so I'm going to try this again now that you guys can hear me. Uh, all right, so my name is Colin. Uh, once again, uh, my app is called CBO, Chicago Black Owned. And uh, my inspiration for this came uh, right around when, uh, kind of when all of the Black Lives Matter protests were starting up and people were sharing around these lists of Black owned businesses that you could support 
uh, in Chicago. And the problem was, I feel like myself included and a lot of my friends wanted to patronize these businesses, um, but Chicago is a very big city. And when you get a list of businesses from all over the city, um, kind of just disorganized, you don't really know. I mean, some of them could be hours away. Uh, you don't really know what, what they have, what, what kind of food they are. So I wanted to make some kind of directory that would make it easy for people to um, just look up what's nearby to you and what, what kind of food you like um, and be able to just like instantly, just five minutes decide where you wanna go eat. Um, so that was, that was what I set out to do with this project. Um, and basically this is the homepage. Uh, you can type in your zip code, you can type in uh, your address and it does have uh, an autofill API from Google. So it'll fill that in for you. Uh, you can also click uh, the geolocation and that should, um, it get, gets your location. So if you don't want to type in your address, you can also do it that way. Uh, when you click search, it'll take you to the directory page. It just takes a moment to come up. Um, and basically you have all these places. This centers around, um, my internet's being a little slow. This centers around where you are. And uh, you can see all these pins on the map of places nearby. Um, if you click this, it will take you to the, the view, the details page. Um, but you can also scroll through and kind of see the pictures, um, categories. If I wanted to see just like Mexican restaurants, I could do that, um, you know, African places. Uh, so once you click on a, a restaurant, um, it'll take you to the details page. Uh, you can see at the top all the relevant information, the address, phone number, uh, whether it's open now, price. And this is all pulled from Yelp, uh, from the Yelp API. Um, this actually will take you to the Yelp page. Uh, the reviews actually were a little bit tricky to implement. So basically this is a, its own image. Um, the, the, the rating from Yelp comes back as like from, from one to five, um, including it can be decimals like 1.5 to 2.5. So we actually interpolate, uh, use string interpolation uh, in the URL for this. So like you'll see the URL for this is uh, small three. Um, so this part actually gets interpolated from Yelp's API. So if Yelp passes through 4.5, it'll automatically put in 4.5 for that image and pull in the, the correct image. Um, I had it all working without Yelp's images, but they require that you use their stars. So uh, that was a bit tricky. Um, this will pull categories. So for this one, there's just one, but for some restaurants, there'll be three or four categories from Yelp. So um, that's relevant. You can see where it is on a map and actually, uh, if you click for directions, it'll pull it up in Google Maps um, to take you right there. Uh, and then it pulls reviews from Yelp. This is the same logic. Um, you can click to read more, uh, see the hours. Um, so basically everything you need. And if you click this, it'll show you kind of more full size images that are pulled from Yelp as well. Um, so that way it's always up to date. I don't know why that's the image, but um, Another feature uh, is favorites. So you can save places as a favorite. Um, you do have to be logged in to do that. Um, so if you wanted to sign up, there's a quick sign up form. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and log into my account. So this is basically just a quick view of all the places you've saved. So if you have places you are wanting to try out or places you really like that you've been before, you can save them and uh, easily just access them right from there. Um, so definitely uh, convenient. Um, and then you have your account, account page if you need to change any of your information, pretty straightforward. Um, so yeah, uh, let's see, uh, one of the other more difficult parts was the map implementation uh, for me. Um, the template did have some kind of map functionality built in, but it didn't really match up with uh, the way that my site was set up uh, and they used Google. I have this on OpenStreetMap. So um, definitely getting that to work was a little bit tricky. I have all the uh, coordinates for all of the restaurants saved in my database. So that's how it's able to plot on the map um, all of the different uh, restaurants all around. Um, so it's not actually using the address, it's using those saved coordinates. Um, and then this is in Vue.js. Um, the template had a lot of jQuery components. Uh, for example, the carousel of images at the top was actually not working at all. Um, and it was because with Vue and, and jQuery, the way the plugin is, is that the, they don't load synchronously. So um, I had to kind of find workarounds. Like I had to install a different image carousel for this um, in order to get that to work. Uh, and a couple things like that. Um, in terms of future implementations, uh, I would really like to add 
a an option if you're logged in to submit restaurants just to ensure like the future to kind of future proof the app and make sure that people are able to um to keep this up to date when when places are updated um would also love to add a little share button just so people can uh, easily share with friends um yeah i think that's about it awesome thanks so much colin uh yeah Colin did a lot of really intense logic on this app and it is, it is showing, it's paying off. So I'll throw it over to Jay for some questions. Yeah, Colin, this is an amazing app, really good cause. And I guess to that end, um, what do you know how you're gonna deploy this site? Cause I'd love to see it reach the finish line. Yes, 100%, I definitely plan to deploy it. I've already told a bunch of friends about it and been like, hey, would you use this if I sent it to you? Um, and across the board, people said yes. So that's what I was hoping for. So yeah, I, I haven't decided uh, yet whether I'm gonna use Heroku or Netlify, um, which are the two services we learned about. So um, I just am weighing the differences and I'm gonna hopefully deploy it this weekend. Uh, so I'm gonna do a little awesome. more work after, probably take today off and then tomorrow I'll probably work on it a little more. Awesome, no, that's great. Um, so I know that the, the review data is coming from the Yelp API, but the actual uh, restaurants and, and uh, places is that where is that data coming from yeah so actually so I had a couple different databases uh, that I used to get the names of different restaurants uh, a couple different websites uh, like I mentioned that people were sharing around um, so I basically seeded my database with just restaurant names um, and then I wrote a script in uh, I can actually show you um, I wrote a script in my uh, back end that basically would take it would it would look up a place in the Yelp API by name, and then it would kind of get the, the ID information for the API, the image URL, and latitude and longitude. Um, so that, that way, basically, um, I didn't have to go in and like manually put in the information for every single restaurant. Um, okay. I just had to put in the names and it would get everything else, uh, which was yeah. a little tricky because Yelp's API can be a little inconsistent, um, but I wanted to make sure I got like the full list of all of the restaurants that I could. Yeah, that's really clever. So are the reviews then actually preloaded into your database? No, point? so they're not. So on, the only information that's preloaded is on the directory page. Um, so Yelp actually doesn't allow you to store any like Yelp proprietary data. So you're not oh. allowed to store the reviews. Mm -hmm. um, so this this information like at like coordinates um, is, is all stored. But then all of this, like the, the address, phone number, um, this is all being, the reviews are all being pulled live from Yelp. So then theoretically, if people write new reviews, like the newer reviews will be the ones to show up. Um, I think they just give you the three most recent on this page. Got it. Got it. That's awesome. Yeah, there's so much complexity. I'm curious to know, like, if you could remember an example of like some, you mentioned inconsistency with the Yelp API. I'm curious to know like what working with that API was, uh, what that was like. Yeah, so it's definitely challenging. Um, Yelp definitely like has a way of doing things and they only want you to do things their way. Um, they're very specific about how you implement things. Um, for example, like one of the things is they don't let you pull from the API if the restaurant doesn't have reviews. So mm -hmm. there was one restaurant and I spent like 20 minutes trying to figure out why mm -hmm. it wasn't coming through. Um, and it was the, the restaurant had no reviews. So they just wouldn't, they refused to provide any information. Um, so that was definitely like a, a kind of weird one-off. Um, yeah. And then I, another thing was I realized places with multiple locations when I just seeded the name information, like it was sometimes pulling in like ra just random places. Like there was one restaurant and it was pulling in a completely different restaurant um, mm -hmm. with a totally different name. Don't know why, um, it was a pretty easy fix. I just had to manually go in and find the, the API key for that restaurant. Um, yeah. But just little things like that, like you kind of, I had to do some quality control. Yeah, well, Colin, this is um, great cause, great app, and it looks great too. Really nice job, congrats. Thank you, thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Colin. And uh, yeah, this was, uh, can you believe that like Colin didn't know what an API was 12 weeks ago? And now Colin is like reciting Yelp's API regulations to us. Like amazing. <laughs> All right. Um, our next presenter is going to be Eric. So Eric, let's uh, share your screen and show us what you got. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Eric Alvar. And um, I'm in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I created this app called Acoustic Music New York City. And this is an app to kind of fill the gap between all the local newspapers and magazines and also the big name uh, 
music uh, concert type things that really do the mainstream bands, the major uh, venues. And so this is something I wanted to make that would be easy for bands to use, users, venues, and specifically in the world I'm in, which is acoustic music. Um, so if you're coming to town and you want to see what's going on, you can come to this page here. This is the home page. And this is an index of all the events that are on uh, the website. So chronological order, um, you can go through and kind of see what's happening. If you want to click on a event, you can see more info, such as the address, the description, and also what tags are associated with this event. So we have um, just a little bit more if you don't know what the band is or what to expect at the show. Um, so a few features of this page too is if you want to search through the events, this searches through the titles and descriptions. I don't know, say I want to find banjo music. Um, these events will come up. Um, one of my favorite features is when I'm coming to a new town, um, I like to know, say I'm off, like on, I'm coming to town this week and I want to see what's going on the nights I'm off. So you can scroll through and see what events are going on. You can kind of decide, okay, I'm off Sunday. I'll go to one or two of these events. Um, another thing is you can search through your styles. Um, I want to see bluegrass, I want to see bluegrass and country. Um, it just goes until there's no more events. Um, so these features all work for anyone coming to the site. You don't need to sign up or anything like that. Um, I'm going to log in. Once you create a user, you get a few more features. So here on the homepage, the new thing with this is now you can favorite events. Um, say I'm off these nights, I want to see these events. Uh, these will send you to your user page and you have a full index of all your favorite events. All right, so I'm not off on Monday. I want to clear that out. You can unfavorite these things here. And this works on a toggle. Um, now any user can submit an event. Um, we're going to do that real quick and uh, see where this goes. Um, we're going to say Bellflex coming to town. All right, description. We're going to be playing the town hall. I have this uh, Google Auto Complete API to fill in the address. That's 43rd. All right, great. Um, and let's say they're playing tomorrow night. We're going to submit this. Um, once you submit an event, it doesn't go to the index. It has to be approved by a moderator. So that's why any user can submit, say, their band or their venue, whatever they're doing. Um, so this gets submitted. And it doesn't show up here until a user or until a moderator, which if you're a moderator, this uh, comes up. I figure there can be multiple, multiple moderators in a city just to kind of help things move along. Um, all right, so this event's here. And it doesn't look quite done. So I'm going to edit this. Uh, missing an image, so we're going to add that. And I'd like to add some text just so it's a little bit easier to follow along with. All right, so we're going to submit. Now the event looks great. I'm going to go back to approve this event. I'm going to approve it here. It's going to now go into the index. What I did here is it adds, um, as an event's created, it doesn't have a moderator ID. And so once it's approved, the moderator ID gets added. Now it's here, you can favorite it. Um, and that's all the features we have with this. A uh, few things, challenges I had, um, styling, um, trying to make a theme work the way I wanted it to uh, was a lot of fun, a lot of, like, a lot of challenges there. Um, one thing was trying to turn check buttons into buttons, um, hiding whether moving the button all the way across the screen or uh, covering it up. Um, I never found one that I was quite happy with. Um, so this looks pretty good. Eventually, I'd like to fix that. Um, one of the other things I had a challenge with was the favoriting. Um, I had gotten it to work on my show as soon as I got to the index. It was a little more complicated. And then I had to get it also working on the user profile. So while I was Googling stuff, I found a gem that actually did all this for me and <laughs> made it super easy. So I switched to that. And um, that use a different approach um, rather than me making a favorites uh, controller. I use this and this has a toggle, which sets up a slightly different um, associations that I wasn't aware of until now. 
um, that I'm excited about to use more in the future. And that is using um, polymorphic and access. Um, so that was interesting and a good thing to learn about. A um, few things, I'd like to put this up as early as next week and just kind of get everything in tune. For now, I guess it's gonna be working with uh, live streams until concerts come back. Um, but I'd like to eventually have it searchable by maybe borough or uh, neighborhood since New York City is so huge. Uh, maybe put a map, maybe uh, where you can see all the events on a map for each night. Um, and I mean, eventually this would be cool. This would be something you could market and just send to other small towns and things like that, um, just because there's such a wide range of, of these up there. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, I'm going to throw it over to Karen to ask you a couple questions about your project. Can you hear me okay? Can. Cool. So nice job on this app. I love the uh, personal inspiration. I was going to ask you what uh, what your inspiration was for it, but then I saw some pictures of you in the left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the events. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, so what was your favorite part of working on this? Um, my favorite part was kind of as, as using this type of thing all over the country for the last couple of years, there's such a wide range of um, applications that do this. And for me, it was really fun to just kind of take my favorite features of each and put it into this project. Awesome. Um, and you mentioned polymorphic and access. So I'm not familiar with those. What role did they have in the project? Um, so this is from the gem and all this stuff was already, as soon as I put the gem in, it kind of redid my work as um, just having uh, belongs to and, uh, and has many kind of things. And so the polymorphic lets a, uh, a model kind of work with multiple other models and um, just kind of connects them and routes them that way. And so through here, we have polymorphic uh, true. And then the users and the events work as, the user works as favorite or, and then the event works as a favoritable. Gotcha, so it's a way to help you organize the backend. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Do you have any advice for the next student who is interested in using this technology? Um, yeah, I guess you can kind of make it work with whatever um, app you're doing, whether it be the applications I was seeing it in as I looked it up was more, um, say you had users and managers and things for companies like that. Um, it made a lot of sense in, in that way. This was the first time I'd seen it used as a favorite or like button. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a really cool feature. Um, are there, so you mentioned some of the things that you wanted to add when you continue working on it. Um, were there any features that you tried to add and you just couldn't get it to work? Um, any challenges that you came across that made you have to abandon some ideas that you had? Yeah, one feature I had um, going was on each event, I wanted a static map to kind of just show the location in New York City. Um, the way I was implementing it, uh, I had it mostly working, but then after getting it, it really wasn't accomplishing the goals of my app. Um, so I took it out and then eventually I'd like to have a more, uh, an app with an interface that kind of is able to move and connect you to where you are. Right, um, which map did you try to use? Uh, the Google Maps uh, static API, yeah. Gotcha. Uh, did you consider any of the other map libraries? I was, um, I figured since I had already set up my API with the autocomplete that I would just stick with this. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much. It was, uh, it was a really cool project and it would definitely be something that I would use. Oh, thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. And uh, we're going to throw it over to our next presenter, uh, who is going to be Luke. So Luke, why don't you share it with us and show us what you've built? You're on mute, Luke. I would have done the whole presentation like that. So thank you for thank you for telling me. Okay, so my name's Luke. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. 
cool. Okay, so my app is uh, was really inspired by the idea that um, you know when uh, you're creating a song, there is a process that is called mixing that uh, is kind of each stage that you go before the final version's ready. You're sort of uh, you know trying to get it get it there. So. Um, because mixing can be a pretty intense process, uh, just as an example, the song Billie Jean by Michael Jackson was mixed 91 times. And each of those 91 times, you're listening to Billie Jean like probably like 20 times. I wanted to create an app that was really focused around uh, producers getting feedback on their music from other producers before the song was officially uh, released. So the, um, the app itself is pretty much built to enable this and I'll show you really quick I have a user, so I'm not going to sign up, but the sign up page is right here. And because I have a user, I'm just going to log in really quick. The idea is once you create an account, you kind of have a, uh, a bio page. And then this bio page is shared with songs that you've kind of uploaded or songs in progress. So each of these is in the process of being mixed. And uh, to view any of these anytime and to view your feedback that you've received, you can just go right over here. And for this specific example, I'm actually going to show this one because this has a lot more uh, example data. So the mixing feedback page is definitely the, I'd say, the most, uh, the most data centric uh, part of my app. And it was the part that required the most time. The mixing feedback page itself kind of functions for the user and for their friends to leave feedback. But the way that this can be interpreted is uh, when you're creating a new song as a user, you can specify the title, um, a description, as in kind of things that you're looking for feedback on, if you have anything um, to give context to feedback that users would, other users be giving you. And then um, you can also have this embed URL. Now, in the case of this song, here's where all of this information is kind of coming through. And as a user, I would simply just grab this and then send this to my friends and say, OK, here's this song. Um, can you give, give, me, give me your notes on it? And then comments would then show up down here with specific parts of the song that would need, uh, you know, maybe further inspection on, um, you know, time stamped and then tagged as well. Um, so just to kind of go into an example of this, now the timestamp I feel like is pretty obvious. The notes could be really anything. Um, this app is definitely built around the technical. So I'll just say um, this EQ needs work. And then you could tag specifically, um, you know, an instrument, and then this comment would then show up. A user at any point can edit their song. So if they had a new version of this, maybe something that they had mixed down, they could put version 2.0 and kind of share a new description um, with what they wanted, and then updating the song with the new uh, embed URL because there would be a different embed, um, and then updating like that. And then they could actually then just send the new version over to their friends for kind of continued uh, feedback. I would say a big part of this, um, you know, in terms of challenges was working first off in the back end with the association between uh, all of these different tags, um, specifically because tags belong to uh, comments, which belong to songs. There is a, uh, uh, the whole nested concept of like nested data was really, I think, conceptually um, difficult for me. And I, I enjoy it a lot, that being said, and I would like to continue kind of experimenting with this and especially expanding the uh, expanding the idea of you know a, a you know an instrument is a all right tag, but there's also a lot of different kinds of instruments. There is guitar, and then within guitar, there's acoustic guitar, there's electric guitar. So you can see how tags is pretty simple right now, but eventually I'd like to expand it to not only um, encompass um, you know instruments, drums, and all this, but also to kind of capture uh, the way that sound is processed. So reverb or how much echo something has, delay, all of this is just right now um, at its core, what is basic to kind of work, but I'd like to eventually create like a search. The last thing I'm gonna say is um, the idea of friending and letting uh, your friends specifically see your stuff, but not having um, other people kind of view it, I think is a pretty core part of this. Um, Unlike SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Music, and all of the other music sites that we have right now for sharing music, this is specifically for sharing music before it's done. And I think because of that, I would like to really focus on the idea of kind of privating, um, privating songs and kind of holding the information back only for specific 
uh, specific users to view. Uh, guests can leave comments as well. So it's not only limited to um, users. And my, my idea in doing that was that uh, if somebody was using this and, you know, just for early adoption, there would be a lot of cases where maybe someone didn't want to make an account to leave feedback. So I could have this song and send this to a bunch of my friends and say, hey, I know you don't have an account, but you can still leave feedback and, you know, give me this really quick. Uh, beyond that, you know, the app, this is the core, this is the meat of the app, and this is what took the most time. The app itself is pretty simple, but I really would like to, uh, you know, expand the filtering as well um, for comments, because I think, uh, especially as more and more comments kind of come in and archiving those comments with new versions, I think there's a lot of logic that can be uh, expounded upon to get this app really functioning in a very like robust way for users um, as they look for feedback. And uh, yeah, you know, I know, I know there's a lot that can be done. So I'm excited to, you know, keep working with it. Well, thanks, Luke. Um, yeah, Luke really, really worked super hard on getting all these nested associations to work. Um, and they do, they all work really well. So I'll pass it over to Jay for some questions. Yeah, sure. Luke, congrats. This app looks great. Um, does that SoundCloud embed work? Uh, yeah, it does. Cool. And I have headphones in right now. Or actually, no, cool. It's, I so can it's hear playing. it. Cool. Yeah. Sweet. That's awesome. Um, what feature would you say you enjoyed building the most? I would say maybe the, uh, you know, maybe the, the just comment structure right here. Mm -hmm. I really was hard set on, on doing tags. And I, um, Danny told me early on that it would be really more complicated and than what I was maybe expecting. And I think it definitely is, but I just love the idea of a user being able to you know, get comments that are really targeted towards specific things rather than just vague um, notes. And I think that the tagging is kind of the structure that would allow uh, down the line someone to be able to like filter. So um, to filter that feedback. So I think that the tagging and the this whole thing was really fun to build. And I, I really did for this whole thing. I, I love the back end. I like love the just seeing how like all of the data kind of um, interacts and corresponds with each other. Yeah, and I, you know, that's a hallmark of a good developer that enjoying the very feature that might also be the most challenging. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess last question is, um, you know, now that you know what you know, having built this project, if you, what advice would you give <laughs> yourself from like a few weeks ago when you were just setting out to build this project? I might tell myself uh, to think about um, I don't know, to think about more attributes specifically for the models and to really think about the, um, the idea of this being more than just a way to collect notes. I think in my initial thought process, I really wanted a very basic app. Um, and I know that uh, me and Danny had conversations about it potentially, like, like I was gonna have everything private by default, but, uh, but yeah, the ability I think to create something more like a, like a social network or something where people can at least have that ability to um, have connections and then those connections can view what is otherwise kind of private or hidden. Um, I would probably tell myself 12 weeks back or you know five weeks back or whatever to think more about that. Um, Cause I think that that would actually be uh, something I wanna do anyway right now. So yeah, I like um, Got it. that and yeah. don't, don't underestimate themes. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, this is fantastic, Luke. Really nice job. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Luke. Um, and yeah, Luke and I had a lot of back and forth on uh, on the schema. And Luke was like, a, he was like a liquid where I would try to control it. And then like something else, he'd be like, but what about this? And I'd be like, no, no, no. And then he'd be like, but what about this? And I'd be like, no, no, no. And we went back and forth. And finally, we settled on something. And I think that he got a really great version of this working. And uh, yeah, I'm very, very pleased with <laughs> how it came out, given how much back and forth we had on this, which was super. I, I was never disagreeing with you, but I definitely <laughs> think, you know, yeah. We, we, had, we had to hone it in a little yeah. bit. Luke yeah, was very sure. ambitious with his ideas. Um, and I mean, rightfully so, like you've got a product that totally works, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> our next presenter is gonna be James. James, go ahead and take it away for us. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is James Odegaard. Um, happy to be here today. 
So I am um, currently residing in Madison, Wisconsin, but before I moved here, um, about I lived for seven years in Decorah, Iowa. And if you don't know um, where Decorah is, it's just a little tiny town in the northern, uh, the northern northeast corner. And uh, while I spent some time, oh, you can see my search history, mosquito nets. <laughs> um, so while I was living in Decorah, um, I started to notice that there were, um, that there was kind of a lack of, of resources for the tech um, side of things for small businesses. So uh, in, in terms of online, you know, a platform, there was really just Facebook for them to be able to get on there and um, to update their information. So I wanted to curate something where folks could come in and display uh, not only their business information, but also their, um, their events that might be coming up. And I know that there are, um, well, yeah, there are very various platforms that you can do these types of things, but with the idea of a small town, there are lots of um, moving bits and people don't always have the same access. So I'm um, having everything kind of centralized in one place was kind of my, my goal here. Um, there are two different types of, of users that we have. We just kind of have the basic general population where you can just come on here and you can see the local businesses that we have, as well as viewing on the map where they are. Um, but then say, and then also you can sort by business um, event specifically if you would like as well. But say I am a local business and I would like to have like, hey, I'm not on here anymore. What, um, or I'm not on here. How do I do this? Well, may as well sign up. Uh, and so if you want to get your business all on here, you can use all this information here. You can put in your hours. You can uh, have a little description there. Also put an image. Um, but say I already have a business, which I do. I happen to be uh, Doug Boodle Industries. This is not real. I don't actually have, have this business we created. Um, I can log in here and visit and see my information. So if I come here on this little show page, you can see um, my business description as well as my events that I have going on and coming up um, as well as the location details as well as a link to, if I happen to have a little website or just a Facebook page, um, I can link to that. Um, so say we have this event coming up here and I actually wanted, I realized that I didn't have a, you know, a tag for it. And so if I don't have that, may as well add that this is a music event and I can update that. Um, one functionality piece that I don't have quite is displaying those tags, but now this is searchable in the events page by adding that tag there, you can search for, um, that music tag. And then if I'm also on my business page, um, I can create a new event. So exciting news coming up. We have a new event that is going to be our Driftwood Bones reunion show. Um, and it's happening next week. It happened a little bit last minute, but we're excited about it. Um, if you don't know who Driftwood Bones is, they're a local band that, um, and there's a little bit of a formatting issue where you can't see it, but that data is, is recorded right there. Um, I promise you'll see in a second. Um, and so we've got a little event description, um, but the Drifted Bones is a local band. They disbanded a few years ago, but they're coming back um, and they're going to reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, oops, sorry. Um, um, and then you can attach a little photo to be linked up with your event. Oops. And this is also a music event and the community. So we'll create that. And then now you'll see this event has been created um, and it actually belongs to, you see it's happening at Doug Boodle Studios. Um, and this is the link back to their page there. Um, so some of the, the difficult features about this for me were, uh, was honestly, I mean, it might be a recurring theme, but um, was the theme. <laughs> Incorporating some of those, uh, those, those bootstrap themes uh, and understanding how some of these moving pieces, um, if you see on this main page, um, some of these, I was having a tough time figuring out exactly how to get some of these moving um, items to work. And, uh, and so eventually I kind of had to do a brute force approach just to get every page to kind of reload and get these JavaScript elements to work successfully. Um, but uh, seeing it, learning how all these things kind of interweave and what types of JavaScript requests need to be made and when do they need to be made and why are they being made? <laughs> um, people talked quite a bit about those rabbit holes and 
I have a tendency to fall down them as well. But that's, I'd, I'd really try to take pleasure in that time and really try to dig deep and um, split apart my brain and figure out what are we doing here and what, uh, how are all these back end pieces synthesizing? Um, some future features that I would like to implement is I'd like to have a calendar function. That was something that I intended to get in there. Um, but something that, you know, on this events page that you'd be able to see, you know, when everything's happening and maybe be able to click on that calendar event and add it to your own. Um, or also be able to, uh, another thing that I was thinking about was that it might be nice if it would automatically delete off the page when the event happens rather than having the user have to manually delete currently. Um, but yeah, some of those things also tag specific searchability, even though you can see here that I can search, you know, music and well, those are all music events. So that's a specifically a beer one. Um, also community, um, oh, we have, I don't know if we added that one in there. Oh, well, um, yeah, a little concert going on there. So you can search through that, but those are the, I would like to add maybe some clickable links to be able to search through and pull up your specific tags. Um, yeah, other than that, it was fun. We had a good time kind of breaking everything down and figuring it out. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, James, for presenting. Um, yeah. When are we? Uh, when are we gonna have that Driftwood Bones reunion show? A little reunion show. We'll see if we can get a live stream. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. I'm gonna throw it over to Karen to ask some questions. Awesome job on the project. So, uh, my first question is, if you could go back and change something about your project or how you approached it, what would you change? Yeah, well, it was actually kind of fun because Danny recommended just yesterday, she said one of the fun projects that you should maybe take on for yourself afterward, she, not just me, the, um, the whole class, is just completely rebuild it. Do the same project, but again, um, and not the exact same, obviously, but um, kind of take time to do exactly what you're saying. Um, and if I could go back a few things, start and end time to an event. I kind of got midway through and realized that I had only put the start time in and I thought, oh, well, um, so that. Um, also, having a stronger sense of where, um, of what my end goal was going to be. Um, at the beginning, I really had a really broad, Danny really honed me in, which was nice to kind of pull it in to say, all right, let's just do an events database to start there. Because then, I mean, um, my ultimate goal is to also have things like a, um, a messaging functionality for um, businesses to be able to reach out and maybe start planning events through here as well. And that's where it started. And then she said, well, that's gonna, that's a, those are a lot of layers and we have so much time. So, and you're one person and obviously we have helped throughout the class, but um, as an element of, it's a, it's a big undertaking doing a, an entire project from front to back. So I think really, um, or from back to front, I suppose is actually more of the order, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think more, I would think a little bit more critically about where my end goal actually was um, because I found myself in my back end suddenly, you know, I created, one, I really liked the code that I was putting together and I think it was very functional, but um, yeah, thinking about all the pieces that I really want to include in the back end from the get go. Yeah, it sounds like you had a lot of ideas and um, that you know you kind of had to hone in, like you said, on, on what specifically you wanted to do. Um, throughout that time, did, how did you keep yourself organized and focused while you're working on it? Like, did you have a Trello board, maybe like a daily schedule yeah. or maybe yeah, meditation? Yeah, working through Trello board um, was really, that was a new uh, feature or a new tool for me to use. And actually that was really nice to be able to kind of keep your, what do you need to do and what's coming up next? But I kind of, I tend to think in a moment of, I've got all these things that are, you know, that are being done. And it's like, where do I classify them? And um, yeah, so that was one of the, one of the means to keep me um, focused, staying and working on one task at a time um, and making sure that I got that thing functional, maybe not completing that thing, but getting whatever it was back to functional or um, was always kind of the, while I was doing the project, making sure I could get to that point. That yeah, um, you said, you talked about a little bit about the challenges you ran into with the bootstrap theme and how you had to use brute force. Can you mm -hmm. kind of talk about how you finally got it to work? Yeah, um, a couple things uh, that, it, well, there were a few. I actually really wanted on this, uh, on your own business page, I wanted the bottom here, I wanted this to be more of a carousel. Um, and I wasn't able to get that quite going, unfortunately. Um, that is something that I, I will hopefully be able to um, work on and maybe figure out. I was, when I was playing at the beginning, I got really comfortable with tinkering, which was really nice. Um, and breaking a thing and then going back and saying, all right, so that didn't work. Oh, okay, now that fixed this. And oh, no, I actually can't tell what that fixed. Um, 
And so to actually get this one to work, I actually had to do a full on, I think if I show on just my main, uh, my main app page, where are we? We just did a brute force on the page, reload it. Um, which is not um, that, not the way that I want it to function in the future. I want to be able to get um, everything. There's uh, everything kind of feels a little bit slow right now because I know we were talking about as you have a simpler app, there's a lot of code that comes with your themes. There's a lot of stuff. And so knowing what is necessary and what is not um, is still something that I am learning and continue, uh, will continue to do as I refine this app. Yeah, awesome. Sounds like you have a great game plan for you know polishing it up. Well, thanks again for answering my questions, and I really enjoyed this project. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, James. Uh, yeah, really, really well done. And uh, we've got one more presenter for our first block. Um, so I'm going to throw it over to Stephen. Go ahead and share your screen, Stephen, and present us your awesome project. All right. Here it goes. Nothing. Oh. All right. Can you guys hear me? All right, on, all right, all right, let's do this. Hi, my name is Stephen Chan, and this is my app. I call it FEH Builder, FEH being short for Fire Emblem Heroes. Um, so I am an avid video gamer, and one of my favorite video game franchises is Fire Emblem. And one of the, one of the games I played is the mobile game, um, Fire Emblem Heroes. Um, so the idea with um, heroes is that you play, you have several, a lot of playable characters. They're called heroes, and each and each character can have um, builds that can be stacked with a bunch of other skills. Um, the point of this app is to is to not only have a database of the heroes list and the skills list, but also be able to for a user to create a build, view it their own, sa save it as well. And also modify it if they need if they need to. It, think of it like an easy way to view to view um, your builds and how to like write it down or like type it on something else. So uh, let us begin then, shall we? All right. First, let me log, first log in. All right then. Let's go first. Take a look at our hero list then, shall we? Um. All right then, so in this list, we have each of our heroes listed. Um, they're listed with um, their full name, which is both the short name and the title. The game they originate from, weapon type, movement type, and the five stats, which is HP, attack, speed, defense, and res. There's also a little picture right here. And if you click on it, you get a lot more of a centralized look at it without having to look at all those data at once. Alrighty then, and um, so as you can see, um, creating this data would have took a long time normally, but I borrowed from from, from an AP, API, which which allowed me to see to, to get all this data without having to like do it all, to type it in manually. Now an API is useful because if the API gets updated. This this uh, uh, this also gets updated as well. But there are also some downsides. One of the thing happens is that if the pictures don't work well, they end up not sometimes, or the data's not there, it doesn't end up showing. There's also a search feature. Let's look up someone like Mark. It utilizes the full name of the character and, and like that, it just filters them out. Let's take a look at our skill list then. Um, as we see here, just like before, we have our entire skill list, name, the effect description, movement types that, you, that can use it, weapon restriction that can use it, Exclusive, which is normally there it, true if the said weapons only can be used like one or like a handful of characters. Range, might, and the weapon and the type, skill type, which comes in six types. Weapon, assist, special, passive A, passive B, and passive C. And as we've seen here, the skill list, the list is ordered by first um, skill type, and then it's ordered in alphabetical order. The hero list is also listed in alphabetical order. And there's a search feature here too that also uses the name. So we should go to our build list. Each build list is only visible to, to, what, to what the user created. And yeah, so why don't we start, start creating a, our own build then, shall we? So I'll call this one um, Princess of Hope because the hero I'm gonna choose this time is Erika, one of my personal favorites. Make that as you will. <laughs> uh, this is skill. Let's go something like um, reposition. That's always a nice one. 
Uh, here it is. And as for skill, um, oh, why, why don't we go with like ether um, weapon? I'd rather choose her own personal skill with a little bit of an upgrade. Uh, let's see, where are you, Sleggy Hide? Uh, there it is, Sleggy Hide. And then passive skills. Um, I'm gonna we're gonna go with um, attack speed attack speed bond three. Uh, the, a little bit of passive healing like renewal will be great. And why don't we go with um, speed tactics? So um, as we create the build, let's find it. Ah, oh, it's right over here. So as you see, not only does it display your build name, name and all this other jazz, but uh, ah yes, depending on what the hero name is going to be listed here, it's going to really showcase the stats, weapon type, movement type, and even a picture. You can even update it, uh, update it, and it's going to just do the same thing. Let's head, let's head back then. Uh, let, also, you can also delete delete builds. Like let's say let's delete this one, and. And it looks like it's not here. It's not here anymore. Cool. So let's do something. Uh, let's. Why don't we, why, we try to like um, update it? Let's see what happens. Uh, hold on. Uh, what the? Hold on. Okay, let's try something else. Okay, okay, let's switch this over to. All right, let's say let's say we switch it over to someone else. As you see here, the data the, the data gets updated. So um, that's pretty much it. Uh, it um, one thing um, I did find a little bit tricky, but, but since I was using an API, sometimes making sure the data matches up can be a little bit tricky, especially when I added new elements. But I but with a little help, I managed to find find a way to get all the information stored. Now there are a couple of things I did want to add in, like for example, for the create new build um, and an update as well. I, if when the hero gets show, shown, I thought maybe the user could also take a look at the, the hero stats, their the image, and any other miscellaneous information. And that's about it. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, Danny. Okay, yeah, yeah, I was going to just make a quick note um, about Stephen's app. Awesome presentation, Stephen. Um, and yeah, it's not like totally obvious, but Stephen is loading in a ridiculous amount of data. That's why those like fields are super populated. And the API that Stephen is using, um, it doesn't have like IDs and it only has heroes' names. So you'll notice like if Stephen clicks on like a hero show page, uh, the URL gets like this really crazy looking interpolation because he's actually using the name and he's like using some G sub methods to basically remove spaces from heroes names to search for them in the API and then like display a URL. So there's a lot of complexity that I think went into Steven's project that's not super obvious, but yeah, he did a really amazing job and really just needed a little bit of minimal help to get going. So great job, Steven. Yeah, Steven, this is a fantastic app. I love how all these gaming APIs actually exist. That's awesome. Um, is this also like some dude just made his own API kind of thing? I, we, when looking it up, um, I, I didn't just immediately found it right away, but I've actually found an API on GitHub that actually showcases the information. The list is a little bit out of date, date but trying to put a new, new information will take a while. So I just make do with what I, what I have. It was, it still had, had a good, had a, the, the, a good, a good list, so to speak. Yeah. yeah, but it probably, was it like well documented or did you really have yeah, to- Yeah, it was really that? well documented. Okay. Like, like um, it, it had like a, even more information than what I posted. Like, you, like the get the, whoever made it really went out of their way, way to even include stats for even, for like even like boons and banes and um, they even to have the skill, skill, skills that the hero start off with, and even lots more information. Even things like a join date, date, which was what's actually kind of nice when the hero was implemented into the game. Lots, wow. lots of information with a very big API. <laughs> wow! And are you preloading that data into your app, or you're actually calling the API I'm, as you're using the app? 
I'm calling the API using an Axi using an Axios method by 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 get, but and then once once that happens, I then showcasing it. I only I, I search up for um, specific information. Ha since the entire thing was an array of hashes, I had to make sure sure um, I had to put, get the right num numbering and the right and the right um, val values to showcase the correct information. Got and it. that made like those things like pretty long because of how many um, sub arrays and sub hashes there were, so to speak. Yeah, it sounds like it was pretty complex. Um, what uh, was your what was the most enjoyable feature to build? Um, to be honest, just like I I can't really say anything specific uh, specific. Just doing this in general for something I like was was enjoy enjoyment in itself. And to be honest, while the data was huge, I already knew how the game worked, so it was actually pretty much it was like a lot easier for me to like read the data and know what and know which ones to extract. I just had to make sure I know how to convert it into a readable format, so to speak. Yeah, no, oh, it's awesome to be able to build an app based on something you're passionate about. Um, this is really impressive, Stephen. Nice job. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to take over your screen share now, Stephen. And basically, yeah, um, this was our first block of students and uh, amazing, amazing job, guys. Um, everyone's a little bit nervous today. So, uh, so far we've started off that first half super strong. Um, we're gonna take a little bit of an intermission right now and we're gonna come back with our second round of seven students presenting their projects. Um, we'll be back with that at 11.15 Pacific time. Uh, that'll be 1.15 Central time, so. Uh, we're going to stop our live stream for now, and then we'll be back uh, in about 20 minutes with our second set of students. So we'll see you then. Thanks, guys.